Silver has been the best performing commodity of 2016, and in appreciation of our listeners, Palisade Radio and Palisade Research are giving away a free American Eagle one-ounce silver round each and every week for the rest of the year. Just visit palisaderadio.com and enter your email for a chance to win. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Aaron out of Prince George, BC is this week's winner for our silver giveaway. If you haven't signed up yet, just go to palisaderadio.com for your chance to win a free ounce of silver. With us today is returning guest, New York Times bestselling author and economist Peter Schiff. Peter, welcome back to the program. Oh, thanks, Colin, for having me on again. Yeah, first of all, I want to congratulate you on the sale of uh, Schiff Gold and uh, your new partnership with Gold Money. Thank you. And, uh, you know, gold has been the place to be in 2016. Uh, The movement in the gold stocks is remarkably reminiscent of 2002, which was, of course, the beginning of a six-year bull market in the sector. And I haven't had you on since the bull market commenced, but I've noticed that uh, TV pundits are being a little less harsh on you uh, on TV. Uh, With the new trend being established here, do you think gold is unstoppable at this point? Well, I mean, I think... There's there are things that could be done to uh, temporarily derail gold. I just don't expect them to happen. Uh, I expect the Federal Reserve uh, to lower interest rates, not raise them. I expect them to do another round of quantitative easing. I expect that they may even bring interest rates negative. And so all of that is just going to fuel uh, the fire that's sending gold prices higher. So my you know expectation is for you know, a, a substantial move upward. You know, if I'm wrong, if the Federal Reserve surprised me and, uh, you know, becomes aggressive in their tightening, then I think that could send gold prices down. But I think it would send stock prices and real estate prices and bond prices down even faster. So on a relative perspective, I think you'll lose less in gold if the Fed tightens. And if the Fed doesn't tighten, if they ease, then I think you'll make more in gold. Uh, than you will in, in the overall stock market. And of course, if, if that happens, you'll probably make more in gold stocks than you will in the metal itself. Uh, but uh, it depends on how speculative you want to be. Well, last week we spoke to Don Cox, a person I know you're familiar with, and I believe he shares many of the same sentiments as you do. He's exceedingly bullish on gold and gold stocks. He's also bearish on the stock market. But he pointed out a serious dilemma, and that's that in an era of negative yields, Gold beats bonds. It pays 0% instead of negative. Uh, But gold does not beat the 2.5% yield currently paid by the Dow. Uh, Now, Don did did caution against participating in the Dow at these valuations because it can crash at any time. But I think his point was that it's impossible to pinpoint when or what will take down the house of cards. Peter, do you think that a stock market crash is imminent? Well, I don't think one is imminent because I believe the Federal Reserve will do what it can to prevent that. Uh, with cheap money. So rather than the market crashing, I think the dollar crashes instead. But, you know, when you talk about a 2% yield on U.S. stocks, the average investor doesn't get that because the average investor might buy his stocks through a mutual fund. And, uh, you know, to the extent that it's a managed fund, the management fees are going to eat up most of that yield. Um, Now, I guess you could buy an index fund where the management fees are lower Uh, But if you're indexing, you're just going to be buying into a broadly overvalued market. And so even though you might get a yield of one and a half percent after you pay your fee, uh, you could see your principal erode if the value of the stocks that you bought went down. I mean, so you have to look at the risk adjusted returns. And I think you're taking a lot of risk for a very meager dividend yield relative to just playing it safer in gold. But, you know, that said, I think there are a lot of stocks around the world alternatives to just a portfolio of gold. And we buy stocks for clients in New Zealand or Singapore or Hong Kong or Norway. And maybe we get yields of six, seven, eight, nine percent. Uh, are decent yields. And we're buying stocks that are not overvalued. They're fairly valued or undervalued based on you know any kind of objective measure of stock valuation. And more importantly, they're paying us dividend yields in New Zealand dollars or Swiss francs or, uh, you know, Norwegian krone or Singapore dollars, currencies that I think, you know, are going to go up against the sinking dollar. Well, speaking of the dollar, you've been very harsh on the dollar, uh, but in the context of other reserve currencies of the world, the euro, the pound, the yen, the yuan, uh, one could argue that the dollar 
will remain in a position of strength, even in a gold bull market, just because the other options are so pathetic. Uh, what do you say to this? Uh, why do you think the U.S. dollar is going to come down? Well, you could argue that, but I, I don't think it's the, the correct uh, position. Uh, you know, the dollar's kind of won because of the perception that it's the cleanest, the cleanest, dirty, cleanest, dirty shirt. If you actually take a good look or more, maybe a good smell of that shirt, I think you'll find out that, uh, you know, we're far from the cleanest. We, we may, in fact, be the dirtiest. But it's the idea that we're not as bad as everybody else that, that's helped with, with the dollar flows. But that is all because of the you know, widespread expectation that the U.S. economy is in better shape than the rest of the world and that the Fed is going to be uh, you know, able to shrink its balance sheet and normalize interest rates. It's all this, these expectations that are, had been working in the dollar's favor. But when those expectations prove false, uh, when the Fed ultimately has to resort to more quantitative easing and grow its balance sheet even further, when the Fed is back at zero and maybe even negative, then I think that is going to weigh very, very heavily on the dollar. In the meantime, the other problems that we have that Japan doesn't have to that degree, Europe doesn't have, is our massive trade deficits. Uh, we, we keep exporting you know, huge uh, quantities of dollars to import goods. We're a massive debtor nation. Uh, that's not the case with the other countries that you mentioned. Uh, and so we have a unique problem. And also the sheer enormity of the money that we owe, uh, not just the bonds, uh, but all the unfunded liabilities. I mean, we're more deeply in debt than any of these other countries. And we're more vulnerable to a backup in interest rates. If interest rates go up, uh, you know, we can't afford to pay. Well, let's stick on currencies for a minute. Uh, nothing gets me more excited than listening to you troll the Bitcoin ad adherents of the world. Uh, Peter, Bitcoin crashed this week on reports of yet another exchange getting hacked. And this time hackers made off with some $70 million of loot. Uh, this whole Bitcoin era has put the bank robbers of the past to shame. Um, I just want to preface this response by stating I'm not anti-Bitcoin, but I don't own any at this time. Uh, talk, to, talk to our listeners a bit about Bitcoin these days. Yeah, well, that's part of the problem with those who advocate Bitcoin as you know, the new gold standard. Look, if somebody robbed you know, a, a vault of gold, you know, the price of gold would drop by 20% just because some gold was stolen. The fact that you could see the cryptocurrency crash by that amount, and in fact, uh, you know, the price of Bitcoin went up to over 700 in early July, around Brexit time, and I think yesterday's low was 465. So you're talking about a better than 30% drop inside of a month. That, that kind of volatility just does not work when you're talking about money you know when you try to talk about a medium exchange and a store of value you know it's too volatile uh, to be money I mean so at best it's just an asset it's a speculative asset it does have uh, liquidity uh, similar to money you know you can exchange it but I can exchange other assets uh, you know I, I, you know for for goods and services doesn't make those assets money uh, you know ultimately though, the value of, of, of Bitcoin may prove to be zero because it doesn't have any value if people don't want to use it as a medium of exchange or store value because there's no real value there to store, unlike gold that, that has significant uses beyond uh, the you know money. And that's, that's why gold became money in the first place. And, you know, the people who were worried about the pound. If you were in Britain and you were worried about Brexit and you, and you put money into Bitcoin, if you still have your Bitcoins, you'd have been better off keeping your pounds. Even though the pound went down, at this point, Bitcoin has gone down even more. But if people in Britain bought gold, if they just would have opened up a gold money account, which they could have easily done and just converted their pounds into, into gold, they're, they're way better off. Uh, because the price of gold in terms of British pounds has gone up dramatically uh, since the Brexit vote. And, you know, gold has held on to its gains. Yes, initially, Bitcoin went up more than gold, but then it collapsed and surrendered all the gains, whereas uh, gold went up on Brexit and then continued to go up, uh, you know, up until I think it's pulled back a little bit today. But as of yesterday, we were at the highs. 
Well, Brexit was certainly good for gold. Uh, if you look back a few years ago when gold hit uh, $1,900 an ounce, that was on the back of uh, Greece's issues in Europe. And uh, Brexit sig uh, potentially has much more significance to the European Union and the world than uh, the issue, the debt issue did in Greece at the time. Do you think that uh, Brexit was a prudent vote for the, for the voters of Britain? And what do you think the implications might be? Oh, yeah. I mean, if I was in Britain, I would have voted to Brexit. I mean, if I was in any country in the European Union, I would vote to get the hell out. Uh, you know, I think it was a mistake to create it in the first place. And the Germans should want out. It's not just, you know, the British. I mean, and the British don't even share the euro currency. Uh, I would want out even more if I was a part of that. Um, but, you know, I think the real driver of the price of gold is not going to be you know, which countries decide to get out of the European Union. It's going to be what happens over here on our side of the Atlantic. I think what's really driving the price of gold is the idea now that's gaining some traction that the Fed isn't going to be tightening interest rates anytime soon. And I think as people start to evolve their positions to the Fed isn't not only is it not going to raise rates, it's actually going to cut them that we're back to uh, quantitative easing and zero percent interest rates and that we're about to embark on a whole new easing campaign that's probably going to be even larger in scope than the last one, uh, then the price of gold is going to just go ballistic. And I think then people will connect the dots and realize that this can never end, that once you go down to the zero bound, you know, once you do all this quantitative easing, that you can never you can never stop. Right? It's like, you know, once you've committed yourself to a drug habit. You're hooked for life. Right. The only way you could kick the habit is to go go through withdrawal, go through cold turkey. And right now, the Fed doesn't have the stomach for that, because in order to get off the habit, it means the stock market has to crash. The bond market has to crash. You know, we have to come down off this high. It means banks are going to fail. It means the government's going to have to default on its debt. I'm talking about the Treasury going to have to default on on its bonds. That's all the bad stuff that's going to happen in order to come down off this high. But if, if the central bankers aren't going to allow that, then they're going to have to keep the drugs flowing. And that means, you know, a lot more money printing and interest rates staying at zero. And the, the gold's got no place to go but up when people finally figure that out. Historically speaking, we don't really have a precedent for where we are today with negative rates and uh, the Keynesian economics being used by all the central banks of the world. If we do have a situation where the the bonds uh, the bonds uh, spike, uh, the stock market crashes, uh, everything basically everything kind of goes to hell, uh, you know, and then gold's obviously going to go up in that situation. Uh, you would you would imagine so much money is going to rush into gold that it could be uh, just a price unfathomable at this point. Can you uh, kind of fast forward a couple years in time and paint a picture of the global economy? Well, I mean, look, there are bright spots in the global economy, but obviously the, the, the problem is, is, is the monetary system doesn't work uh, with the, the, uh, the dollar at the center of it. And you have all these central banks all around the world that are you know, endeavoring to keep their currencies weak and are worshiping at the altar of inflation. You know, you had the Bank of Australia, Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, two days ago, I think, they reduced interest rates to an all-time record low. And they did that despite a housing bubble, despite the fact that, you know, they don't have a high unemployment problem or, the, you know, economic growth. The, the sole purpose of the rate hike, at least what they claim publicly, was to raise the inflation rate, that the cost of living, the way they measure it, is rising annually at about 1%. And according to the Bank of Australia, that's not enough. The cost of living has to go up by 2 to 3%. And it's their job to make sure, which, you know, to me, is, is the complete opposite of what people actually want. They want their cost of living to go down. Uh, and the fact that it's going up uh, doesn't mean that the central bank should try to make it go up even faster. Uh, people should be striving for a reduction in their cost of living because that's how you get an increase in your standard of living. But all these policies are detrimental uh, to the global economy, but it's all rooted in uh, this, this monetary system that we have where the dollar is the center of it, and it's really corrupting uh, the monetary policies of, of all the countries that, that hold dollar reserves or try to you know, peg their currency in some way to the dollar or try to not have their currency be too strong relative to the dollar for some fear that it somehow it's gonna hurt their economies because it's gonna jeopardize 
uh, their exports. But, you know, the, the big problem with the global economy is that you have countries like the United States that run huge deficits because we don't produce enough ourselves and we force the rest of the world to do the hard work for us. And then they ship us what they produce. And all we do is give them little pieces of paper, which will never have any value. And, and these huge, uh, you know, imbalances are really destabilizing uh, the global economy. You have these uh, emerging markets that are sitting on stockpiles of U.S. treasuries uh, that they have bought to prevent the dollar from crashing. Uh, but those monetary policies create distortions in their economy. So you have all sorts of malinvestments that result from these huge trades imbalances that result from the dollar being a reserve currency. So this cycle has to end. And I think the only way it ends is to the point that it's no longer the reserve currency. Trump versus Hillary is a topic that's been beaten to death. I've heard several people ask you questions about it, but uh, uh, listeners just can't get enough. It's, it's so interesting this time around in the U.S. elections. I know that you personally support Gary Johnson, as would I if I were to vote, uh, and he's going to garner a lot more support than an independent or libertarian normally would because voters are uneasy about the other options. Uh, but realistically speaking, Trump or Hillary have, a, have the, the, the better chance of making it to the presidency. Uh, Hillary would almost certainly continue on the path of Bush and Obama, uh, wars, more money printing, uh, kind of the same old. Trump maybe could usher in a new era. Does that excite you? Well, I don't know. It's a wild. He's a wild card. But I think what's interesting is that you've got so many people in the mainstream of the Republican Party that seem to feel that they dislike Trump so much that they, they they're going to go for Clinton. But they could easily support Gary Johnson. And the interesting thing is, if enough big Republicans came out in favor of the libertarian ticket, which includes two former Republican governors, one from Massachusetts, right? uh, and who is friendly with, uh, with Mitt Romney. But if some of these big Republicans came out in favor of Gary Johnson, Gary Johnson would get enough polling to be included in the debates. If that were the case, I'm sure the libertarian ticket, with the support of a lot of establishment Republicans, would get enough votes in enough states to prevent either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump from gaining a majority of the electoral votes. That's not that hard to do. That would throw the election to the House of Representatives where the Republican controlled House could pick the next president and they could pick Gary Johnson. So if they don't like Donald Trump, they have a path to Kerry Johnson, which is actually very realistic. The fact that they won't take it, right? They actually prefer, the Republicans actually prefer Hillary Clinton to, a, a, to Gary Johnson. So they're actually closer in line with a, a, a far liberal Democrat than they are to a real free market advocate, which really shows you to the extent to which we really have a one party system because the establishment of the Republican Party would prefer an establishment Democrat to an outsider like Trump running as a Republican or to a Republican running as a Libertarian. All right. Well, listen, uh, Peter, we started with gold and gold stocks. You mentioned a bit uh, at the end here. I would, I'd like you because you do it so much better than me to kind of plug your various different uh, products and things that you're working on. Uh, but I want to end with gold stocks. They, they have a lot of leverage to the price of gold. And this year they've performed incredibly well. The uh, HUI is up, I think, uh, well over 100 percent, which represents the, the gold miners index. Uh, how do you invest uh, personally? I know you have some products there that people can look at. But wh what are you looking for in the gold stocks? Yeah, I own a lot of individual gold stocks. And of course, I even manage a fund, which I think is the best way for people who don't necessarily want to do their own research. I mean, we're doing really well with the Europe Pacific Gold Fund. EPGFX is the symbol. Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, I think it's up uh, about 130 percent or so so far this year. And it's only seven months into it. Uh, and, you know, I think we're just getting started because so all we've done with the gold stocks is recover ground that we never should have lost in the first place. Uh, we still have a long way to go. I think it's still very, very early in this cycle uh, from, from the metals, especially you know, if I'm correct on what I believe the Federal Reserve is going to do. Uh, so yeah, I, I like that fund. 
But I also have other funds that I manage outside the gold sphere. I don't think people should have all their money in gold or gold stocks. They should be diversified. But I don't think you should keep much money in dollars or the United States. So I think the key to your diversification is to diversify outside the United States, but also avoid some of the other countries that are having problems. We're not the only country that's having problems. I think we have the biggest problems, but I'm not going to you know, overlook problems that other countries have. So I want to be very selective in where I invest my money and where I invest my clients' money. So people could get a hold of me at my brokerage firm, Euro Pacific Capital. It's europac.com, E-U-R-O-P-A-C.com, to talk with one of my brokers about uh, the managed accounts that we have or my funds or have setting up a brokerage account with us. If you want to buy some physical precious metals, you can do that uh, through my company, Shift Gold, shiftgold.com, or, you know, through gold money, you can sign up and have a gold money account at goldmoney.com and uh, just begin saving in gold and have uh, have gold that you can use as money that you can spend or you, you can receive payments. If you happen to provide services or you, you sell products, you want to be paid in gold, there's a vehicle for doing that. So you can avoid uh, the fiat system you know, as much as you can because ultimately there's a currency crisis coming. As far as following me on the Internet, I mean, I do do a video blog. Uh, podcast. My podcast is usually two or three a week at shiftradio.com or you, I upload them to my YouTube channel at the Shift Report. So you can follow me there. Uh, also at europac.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. You can sign up for my weekly digest. There's a lot of ways that uh, you can stay in touch with me. And of course, you can, you know, friend me on Facebook or whatever. Follow me on Twitter. I'm, I'm on all this, you know, the traditional uh, social media outlets. Well, Peter, thank you so much. I always appreciate your contribution to the show. And uh, thank you for, for plugging your various different products. I, uh, I've read several of your books, and uh, I'm, I'm most interested in learning how to properly plug my products. So I always take a keen interest in, uh, in listen, listening to yourself. And uh, anyway, thank you so much for coming back on the program. We'll get you back on very soon. All right. Take care. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? 